Uh, yeah, uh, and I know that Keith had some opening remarks, uh, so I'll defer to him and then pick it up after he's ready. Uh, these are just going to be some brief remarks for those that are on the phone and for the folks that are here. First off, thank you very much for participating in, in what will be your hazard mitigation plan. Um, acknowledge that this is a process that is designed to help it so that we have the capability of being eligible for FEMA funding. More importantly, this is an opportunity for every community and jurisdiction to look inward and figure out how you can protect your citizens better, doing it up front so we don't have to put the community together afterwards, put it back together again. So uh, again, we're, we're looking at those processes that FEMA is going to require, but I really encourage all of you to look at what is best for your community. Some of them are going to involve uh, uh, financial backing, some of them are going to involve you doing things uh, within your community that might be based upon zoning or other other processes. So to keep things brief, that's all I've got. Well, thanks, Keith. And, and I'm going to apologize up front. This wonderful technology seems to keep kicking me off the network. So I'll keep reinitializing the PowerPoint uh, as we go. Hopefully, we can get through this pretty quickly. Uh, I did email out a copy of the PowerPoint. I think I emailed it out yesterday. So uh, if it's easier for you to follow along with that, please do so. I'll try to keep my, my remarks brief. Uh, my name is Kyle Karsten. I work for an outfit called Amec Foster Wheeler. Uh, we're located out of Denver and Boulder, Colorado. Uh, <coughs> We're a consulting firm. We've been brought on uh, through the state to work with you in Story County on your the update of your hazard mitigation plan. Uh, as far as the, the, the organization's background, uh, hazard mitigation plan, uh, hazard mitigation planning is 80% of what we do. So I think that we've got a, uh, a, a pretty good reputation for developing good plans that work for communities. And I, uh, I want to make sure that as we go through the process with Story County, uh, that reputation continues. And we also, uh, we wrote, we did your previous plan five years ago, so we're pretty familiar uh, with the county uh, and your hazards. And not only that, but I am from Story County. So before I, before I moved to Denver, I uh, moved to Denver three years ago, uh, I spent 13 years with Iowa Homeland Security and Emergency Management, but before that I graduated from Iowa State. I grew up in Nevada, class of 1999. Uh, so pretty familiar with the county and, and, and the county's near and dear to my heart. So uh, looking forward to working on this plan. Uh, before we get started, um, I know that uh, Keith has uh, a sign-in sheet in the room that he's in. Can we get the folks on the phone? Uh, Matt from Nevada, I know that you're here. Uh, but anybody else on the phone, uh, let us know that you're here and, and what jurisdiction you're representing. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. This is Nicole Beezer with the Sheldon City Council. Welcome. Anybody else? I'm still here, Kyle, so I'm going to just follow along in your PowerPoint, if you don't mind. I can't get into the um, site, so. Sure, no problem. Uh, well, I'll hear it. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. This is Kashyyyk with the City of Ames. Welcome. Anybody else? All right. Well, we'll hear them if they are. I'll hear them if they sign in, and, and, and we'll pick them up as they as they come. As far as what we're going to talk about today, I'm, I'm not going to keep you for the full two hours. We'll talk a little bit about the purpose of hazard mitigation planning. We'll talk about grant programs linked to the approved plan, and, and as Keith said in his remarks, Story County has been very proactive. Uh, you, you're, you're one of the counties that has really put your hazard mitigation plan to work. Uh, and made it work for you. So we'll talk about uh, a couple of the grant programs that are linked to the approved plan. Multi-jurisdictional approach, how we're gonna approach the process multi-jurisdictionally. The planning and participation requirements. So what we need out of each jurisdiction to be considered a participant in the plan. Uh, public involvement, how we wanna get the public involved. We don't wanna do this in a vacuum. Uh, so we'll talk about public involvement. Uh, Data collection guides, one of the things that uh, I sent out yesterday and, and we'll ask you to do uh, when you provide or to give us some information is, is community data collection guides. 
Uh, we'll discuss and prioritize hazards. We'll talk a little bit about critical facilities and what those are and then next steps in the planning process. So what is mitigation? So when we talk about hazard mitigation, uh, we're talking about any sustained actions taken to reduce or eliminate long-term risk to human life and property from hazard events. Usually when we talk about hazard mitigation, we're not so much talking about, uh, about you know, buying SCBAs or fire trucks or stuff like that. We're talking more about long-term development that you can do to reduce the impacts of hazards to your communities. And an example might be building a levee or, or something like that, something that's more structural. Um, Mitigation planning is a process for communities to identify the hazards to which they are at risk, to assess the potential impacts of those hazards, to develop goals, objectives, and actions uh, that are that buy down that level of risk and reduce those level of impacts, and then pri and then will help you prioritize and implement mitigation actions. So basically, what we're doing is we're, we're doing is we're taking a look at all the different hazards. We're trying to figure out how they can hit each one of your communities, and if it's different for each community, you know, what is what are the differences between how that hazard can impact you? Maybe, maybe uh, you know, community A is really susceptible to flooding and community B isn't by a river. Uh, we go through and we try to, we try to uh, identify that in the plan. Kyle, so examples of mitigation, building hey, a dam and levee system, building Kyle. a freighto site, uh, using fire resistant construction techniques, and then wildfire mitigation and tree trimming around power lines. Uh, so as you can see, it's, it's more, uh, uh, more um, uh, structural, not so much response, a lot more uh, before the disaster ever happens, and that's what we're trying to take a look at. So why do we do this? Well, we've noticed some trends resulting in increased costs for disaster, uh, disaster and recovery. Uh, one of the things is that in a lot of our communities, we have population, population and uh, community growth. We have more people that are living in hazardous areas, and this causes greater exposure to risk, whether it's risk to people or risk to infrastructure, risk to buildings. We're seeing more hazard events. Uh, we're seeing more disaster declarations, and the disaster declarations seem to, seem to get more and more expensive, and the impacts seem to be much, much worse than they ever used to be. And it tied in with that more disaster declarations, we're seeing an increase in disaster response and recovery costs. They're just putting in more funding uh, and it's costing more to get people back during the recovery process to where they are, where they were before. So, 15 presidential major disaster, uh, major, major presidential disaster declarations that kind of included Story County since 1970. Uh, a lot of severe storms, a lot of flooding, uh, a lot of tornadoes, uh, and that's pretty much you know pretty much weather hazards until you get down to 2005, which is Hurricane Hurricane Katrina evacuation, and that was the entire state. That uh, that was the entire state that uh, received uh, a disaster declaration for that. And it looks like some of you are following along the PowerPoint, so I'll let you know. We're going to move to the next slide, so we're at the types of incidents per 15 declarations. So the table here just shows uh, just what it says. Uh, of your 15 disaster declarations, 12 of them were for flooding. One was for high winds. One was severe. Well, 12 was included severe storms. Five included tornadoes and two included winter storms. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about why addressing these trends is a priority. Uh, increasing costs of response and recovery. The cost of doing nothing is too high. Uh, we have a graphic in here somewhere, but, but you know, we, we too often we fall into the trap of we build something, it's vulnerable to hazard A or hazard B. So hazard A or hazard B or, uh, inevitably happens, destroys what we've built. We go back, we rebuild it the exact same way, and shockingly, the hazard comes up again and does the same amount of damage. And it's just this vicious cycle where we go through and we, we, uh, we, we just see uh, uh, the same types of damages over and over and over. The nice thing is that a lot of those events are predictable, predictable and repetitive, and they're predictable and repetitive in different ways, but even in Story County, you've probably got a pretty good idea of where, uh, where different disasters, or excuse me, what types of disasters you're vulnerable to, and, and even in some of those, where they might occur. An example is flash flooding. Usually communities I work with 
have a pretty good idea of, you know, when they get six inches of rain or a lot of rain, it's going to be, you know, this intersection always floods, this intersection always floods, this intersection always floods, and it's because maybe the storm sewer can't handle it. The same with uh, the same with uh, floodplains. We know where floodplains are. I can map where a hundred a hundred year floodplain and a five hundred year floodplain are. It's predictable to figure out where that water is going to rise. Loss reduction. The nice thing to know is that loss reduction activities, and you guys are a perfect example of this, can be implemented. Uh, when they're implemented correctly, they work well, they're cost effective, and they're environmentally sound, and there's funding available to help. And that's one of the nice things about this mitigation plan is it, it offers you the opportunity to uh, receive funding uh, for projects that you identify in the hazard mitigation planning process. And finally, the other reason that we would do this is it, 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 I would go much more with ethical than legal, but you do have legal responsibilities as a community to protect your citizens. And you have ethical responsibilities. It's just a good thing to do. You want what's best for your citizens. And if you know that a disaster is coming, taking measured steps to lessen the impacts of the disasters, uh, it, to me, is an ethical choice. I forgot to say, too, I, I run a really loose ship. So if you guys have any questions as I'm going through this, just interrupt me and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it as it comes up. And there's that graph. And the next slide, there's the graphic that I was talking about where we rebuild, we destroy, we rebuild, we destroy. So when we talk about mitigation, what we're talking about is any sustained action taken to reduce or eliminate long-term risk to human life and property from hazards. And as we go through the process, we'll probably have a lot of conversations about what constitutes hazard mitigation versus what constitutes preparedness or what constitutes response or what constitutes recovery. And that's one of our jobs is to make sure that we go through and help you identify mitigation measures uh, versus uh, other types of emergency management measures that we can talk about. The next slide, what we follow is the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000. So when we talk about mitigation planning, you know, the federal government and FEMA are actually pretty stringent on hazard mitigation plans. They know, they know what they want to see. Uh, they know how they want the planning process to take place. So if we ever do anything in this planning process and, and, and you sit there and you think, well, this is dumb, why are we doing it this way? It's probably because the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000 is requiring it. What it requires is local governments to adopt a natural hazard mitigation plan to maintain eligibility for FEMA mitigation funds. So, I mean, if you don't have a hazard mitigation plan, you're not in trouble. But the flip side of that is, let's say that you have a major disaster or there are a couple of annual appropriations for mitigation funding. You could have the greatest, I mean, you could have the greatest uh, uh, mitigation project in the world. And if you're not covered under a hazard mitigation plan, and that's not included under a hazard mitigation plan, then you're not going to get any type of federal funding for it. That's just, I mean, that's just the rules. That's what DMA 2000 says. Uh, the plan has to be updated and approved every five years. And it, or, so it has to go through a couple of approvals. It has to be approved by the state of Iowa. So Iowa Homeland Security and Emergency Management will look at it first. And then it has to be approved by FEMA. And FEMA has a, a review sheet that uh, they go through, uh, and we have criteria that we have to meet, but we have a planning process in place that'll get us to where we need to go with that criteria. We have a pretty good track record of getting stuff through FEMA with little to no comment back. And then this is an update to the existing Story County Multi-Jurisdictional Hazard Mitigation Plan approved in 2014. Uh, the next slide, like we talked about, approved hazard mitigation plan establishes eligibility for uh, FEMA hazard mitigation grants. There's a couple of them. There's the hazard mitigation grant program, there's the pre-disaster mitigation grant program, and there's the flood mitigation assistance grant or program, which includes repetitive loss, those properties that keep getting hit over and over and over and over again, and then, excuse me, and then severe repetitive loss. On the next slide, a little bit about the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. So the HMGP, if you ever, I, I use a lot of acronyms because I used to work for the government. The, HMP, the HMGP uh, provides grants to states and local governments to implement long-term hazard mitigation measures after the major disaster declaration. So when you, let's say that hypothetically you had a tornado go through and, and, and did a bunch of damage and you got a presidential disaster declaration, 
Uh, this money, for the most part, would open up as you go through and as you recover because it makes sense to, as you rebuild, implement some of these mitigation measures and these mitigation projects to protect the stuff that you're trying to rebuild from future damage. It's equal to 15% or 20% uh, for enhanced plan states, which Iowa is one, so it's equal 20 to 20% of the first $2 billion uh, of estimated aggregate amounts of disaster assistance. Um, and then it's based on a sliding scale formula after the first $2 billion. Eligible applicants are state agencies, local governments, private nonprofit organizations, or Indian tribal governments. The kicker here, uh, like we've talked about, and I'm going to beat it to death, is, is an approved local mitigation plan is required. On the next slide, the pre-disaster mitigation program, or the PDM, this is an annual appropriation. Uh, it's a nationally competitive grant. 75% of it is federal and 25% of it is non-federal. Uh, but again, an approved mitigation plan is required to be able to access this funding. On the next slide, the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program is also an annual appropriation. But for this one, the sub-applicants must participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. It has to be focused on an NFIP insured property, 75% federal and then a 25% non-federal match and an approved local mitigation plan is required. On the next slide, um, what is going on? This guy's going crazy. Uh, the next slide uh, is a list of the hazard mitigation assistance grants awarded in Story County. So you guys have had almost four point, or almost four million dollars in projects implemented. Uh, you've you've done uh, well elevation, electronic control elevations, school safe rooms, uh, community safe rooms, backup generators. Uh, writing the hazard mitigation plan, which counts as a mitigation activity, uh, water main protection, generators for water plants, property acquisition and demolition, uh, and then safe rooms in the vet med uh, buildings at Iowa State. So, uh, like I said, you guys are kind of a model for, for the rest of the counties in the state with what you've been able to do with emergency, with uh, mitigation funding. Um, you've been able to put it to good use and really help, help the citizens in your jurisdiction. Uh, the next slide, uh, so there are nine tasks to complete the plan update and uh, we go through uh, all nine. They're all laid out by uh, the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000 and Federal Hazard Mitigation Grant Guidance. So task one is to determine the planning area and resources. Task two is to build the planning team. Uh, you guys are here, so congratulations, you're on the planning team. Uh, task three, create an outreach strategy. Task four is review community capabilities. Task five is to conduct a risk assessment. Task six is to develop a mitigation strategy. Task seven is to review and adopt the plan. Ta task eight is to keep the plan current. And then task nine, once we've gone through and we've, we've, we've developed the whole plan, uh, we'll hopefully walk out, uh, you'll have developed a safer and more resilient community as you implement the projects that you've identified. So on the next slide, just talks about the planning area. Like we said, it's a multi-jurisdictional plan. Uh, so the local governments that are participating, unincorporated Story County, Ames, Nevada, Story City, Huxley, Slater, Roland, Gilbert, Maxwell, Colo, Cambridge, Zeering, Collins, McCallsburg, Sheldahl, and Kelly. The school districts, Ames, Nevada, Ballard, Gilbert, Roland, Story, Colo, Nesco, Collins, Maxwell, and then Iowa State University. On the next slide, just to give you some of the benefits of participating in the multi-jurisdictional plan, it enables a comprehensive approach to mitigate hazards that affect multiple jurisdictions. It allows you to share costs and resources where able, avoid duplication of efforts, uh, and then improves coordination and communication among local jurisdictions and imposes external frameworks and schedule on the process. The next slide, the slide that, that uh, talks about the requirements for each participating jurisdiction. So for each jurisdiction, we're going to ask you to designate at least one representative to serve on the Hazard Mitigation Planning Committee. And the planning committee is going to meet three times during the planning process. Uh, this is meeting one, so we've already got one of those three down. And this, is, this will be the only one that is, that is over Skype and over, uh, over a webinar. Uh, the next two, I'll come out to you guys and we'll, we'll meet face to face. Uh, the other requirements, we want to make sure you provide data for and assist in the development of the updated risk assessment that describes how various hazards impact your jurisdiction. 
We'll ask you to provide data to describe current capabilities. I talked about that uh, data collection guide and a lot of that stuff comes from that. We'll ask you to develop and update mitigation actions. We're gonna wanna have every jurisdiction have at least one mitigation action that's specific to their jurisdiction. Uh, whether that's a new action or a continuing action that you that you pull over from the other plan, uh, either one of those is okay, but we're gonna wanna make sure that each jurisdiction has at least one mitigation action. Uh, we'll want to add, we're going to ask you to inform the public, local officials, and other interested parties about the planning process and provide opportunities for them to comment on the plan. Uh, we, uh, we don't want to do this planning process in a vacuum. Uh, so we want to get as many people, including the public, involved as we can. We get them involved in different ways, uh, but we want to get as much input in this planning process as possible. And the more input that we get, uh, usually I find the better plan that we come up with. And then finally, uh, once the plan is done and it's approved by FEMA, uh, we'll ask you to go through uh, uh, and do an adoption on the plan. And once the plan is adopted, you're covered under the plan for the next five years and you don't have to do this process again for another five years. The next slide, what happens if your jurisdiction chooses not to participate in the jurisdiction? Well, or excuse me, not to participate in the plan. Well, like I said, uh, you're not, I mean, you're not breaking any laws and you're not doing anything wrong. Basically, if your jurisdiction chooses not to participate in the plan, uh, all jurisdictions, including the public school districts that have not participated in a FEMA approved mitigation plan will not be eligible applicants for FEMA hazard mitigation assistance grants. So when all that money comes available and, and you guys, you know, the county has a list of great projects, if, if your jurisdiction didn't participate, you're not gonna be eligible for any of that federal money to help implement those projects. Uh, the next slide, the Hazard Mitigation Planning Committee. So the next thing that we wanna do is build the planning team. Uh, like I said, uh, you guys by, by uh, uh, being involved in this meeting are right now what we have for the Hazard Mitigation Planning Committee. Now I know uh, some folks, you, you know, you may, you may uh, uh, hear the spiel here and think, you know, maybe somebody else is better to uh, be involved in the process. If you do, that's fine, but we're going to ask for at least one representative from every jurisdiction. And when we talk about representatives, uh, we'll take, I mean, we encourage you to have as many representatives as you think are applicable during the hazard mitigation process. Some of the people that we recommend are if you have, and this is the list on this slide is, is kind of a basic list, so you may or may not have uh, these folks. I think for the most part you guys do. But if public works directors, floodplain managers, city and county planners, elected officials, emergency responders, county and city clerks, economic development directors, GIS staff, school principals, school facilities directors, and school superintendents, those are kind of the people that we, uh, that we ask uh, at least to be part of the process if they can. Uh, if you have any questions about who from your jurisdiction should be involved in the planning process, please give me a call or give Keith a call and either one of us will be happy to uh, provide you some input on who should be in the process. And I bet Melissa would too. So uh, if you can't get a hold of any or either of us, give Melissa a call and she'll help. Uh, we also look at stakeholders. So if there are stakeholders that you could think of that uh, you, you uh, want to have involved in the planning process, Maybe, maybe business partners, maybe private nonprofits, uh, state agencies, including Homeland Security and Emergency Management, Department of Natural Resources, Department of Human Services, Department of Transportation, federal agencies, including the Federal Emergency mm -hmm. Management Agencies, academia. Uh, I'm not sure if Iowa State has a, has a, uh, a um, emergency management related program. They didn't when I yes, was there. Yes, they, uh, they do. Uh, if they do, maybe getting someone from them to come in and participate in the plan and then local and regional. Kyle? Agencies. Yes. Yes, Iowa State University does have an emergency management program and their <clears throat> representative is here in the meeting tonight. Well, where were they in 2004 when I was trying to major <laughs> in emergency management? Well, it's not a major emergency management. Right. The environmental health and safety people um, have been drafted to be the oh, emergency okay. manager. So Angie Jewett is here from Iowa State. Oh, hey Angie. Hello. Um, so uh, when we go through and we look at the planning team, a lot of those state agencies, when we do the final draft of the plan, uh, we'll send it to them and ask them to take a look at it. And that'll give them at least some, that'll give them the opportunity to be 
uh, involved in the process. But uh, if you want to be involved in the process earlier, just let us know, and we'll invite uh, pretty much whoever, whomever, whomever you think should be there. Uh, and like I said, that that can be an ongoing conversation with with Keith or with me or or. Uh, as you go through it and, and try to identify it. And, 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 and I'm serious, if you have questions, if you're confused about who should be part of the process, just ask one of us and, and we're more than happy to help you identify who should be, a, who should be on board. Uh, the next slide, public involvement. Uh, so one of the requirements is to create an outreach strategy. And we do this a couple of different ways when we do plan denial. One is during the drafting stage. So we use SurveyMonkey. I don't know how many people on the call are familiar with SurveyMonkey. Uh, it's a pretty nifty tool that, you know, we give you the link. You click on the link. We have a seven survey question a questionnaire. Uh, it asks uh, questions about uh, you know, how the public perceives different hazards and, and what their impacts on their community may be, how vulnerable they think that they are. Uh, and then it also asks questions about what kind of projects do you think that, that the planning committee should, should uh, focus on as we go through the process. Uh, and then we have a couple of open-ended questions in there that people just, you know, they can give us their spiel on different hazards and why they think they're important. Sometimes we get some pretty interesting uh, comments on that open-ended spot. So one of the things that I'm going to ask you to do is, I'll, I'm, after this meeting, uh, and it probably won't be till early next week because I'm out of the office tomorrow through Monday, but I'll, next week I'll send you a summary of this meeting. Uh, it'll have the link to the SurveyMonkey uh, survey included. Uh, I'm going to ask you in each one of your communities, uh, spread it far and wide. Uh, put it on social media, put it on your community or county websites. Uh, however you guys share information that you want the public to see, we usually fall back on, on what you guys do. Uh, you can share it electronically and that's just with the link. I also emailed out a, a hard copy of the survey. If you want to put hard copies of the survey out for the public to get that way, uh, that's totally fine. If you want to get them and then collect them uh, and email them to me or send them snail mail to me, uh, we can get them inputted into the Survey Monkey and uh, and go from there. We want to get as many of these surveys as we can uh, because it really does uh, it really does give a nice. Uh, uh, baseline for where the public is and what they think about different hazards. Uh, when you do that, uh, one of the things that FEMA is, is really uh, stressing when we go through the hazard mitigation process is documenting that process. So, if you put the if you put the hazard mitigation or excuse me, if you put the Survey Monkey link up on, let's say you put it on Facebook or you put it on a county website, just do me a favor and take a screenshot of you doing that and send it to me. And that will go a long way towards showing and documenting that, that we actually, you know, did the survey and, and, and gave people the opportunity to respond. Uh, we'll keep the survey open until April 30th of 2018. And if we're getting a ton of responses all the way up to April 30th of 2018, we may fudge that date a little bit back a little bit. Um, usually by that time, uh, the, the, the responses have pretty much waned off. But uh, the, the date is, will be around April 30th, but if we get up to that 30th deadline and we're still getting a ton of surveys, uh, we'll make sure that all of those included. And if we end up do, if we do end up getting an extra survey or two after that deadline, I'm not gonna discount anybody. It's just nice to give people a, a hard deadline uh, that they can plan towards. The other way to do creating the outreach strategy is, is prior to approval. So uh, prior to the approval, uh, we'll have a public review draft so the way that the drafts go, we'll, we'll, we'll do a draft of the hazard analysis and risk assessment. I'll send that to you guys separately. That'll be the results of our next meeting. Uh, after that's done and we've gone through and developed the mitigation strategy, we'll do the first administrative draft, uh, which is going to be the whole plan buttoned up. If I have any other information I'm looking for, I'll highlight it in that draft and send it out to you guys. Once you guys, the HMPC, the Hazard Mitigation Planning Committee, Excuse me. Uh, once you guys have uh, have approved the plan uh, internally, it'll go out for public comment. And what we'll do is we'll ask you to uh, probably post it on your county website, any community websites where people can look at it, they can download it, they can provide comment at their leisure. And then we also ask that you do hard copies and provide at least two hard copies in two locations uh, in the county. 
Uh, like I said, we fall back on on what the county normally does. So if you're if you're used to putting things in, you know, the, the Nevada Public Library or the Ames Public Library or having a copy of Story County Emergency Management and just having people drop by if they want to see it, uh, we follow your lead on that. But we're going to want to have those hard copies posted at least two two public locations. And then again, when you when you publicize where that stuff is. Uh, we'll try to grab a copy of that uh, so that we can put it in the planning process folder. All right, one of the things that we always ask when we go through this uh, presentation here is, do you guys have any other types of events that are going on in the next couple of months that we can use um, uh, to, we can kind of piggyback on, I've got no shame about piggybacking on other people's stuff, uh, that you know the public will be together and we can, we can talk to them about the hazard mitigation planning process and how they'll be involved. The example that I always throw out, and it's not a very good example for this time of year, but I'm, I'm sure that, you know, Story County has a booth at the Story County Fair where they talk about emergency management. Uh, mm -hmm. Prepare Fairs is another example of, you know, uh, something that, that is going on across the county where we can talk about the mitigation plan. Does anybody know of anything going on? Uh, that we can we can give you some information about the mitigation planning process and how the public or anybody else can get involved. Kyle, I don't know of anything uh, on the schedule uh, countywide. Okay. Well, and and you guys, your guys' county plan is is nicer than most of the ones that we do because since we're we have a lot of time uh, before the plan expires. Uh, we have kind of stretched the planning process out, process out a little bit more. Uh, so that'll be an ongoing conversation as we go through it. If stuff comes up, just let us know. You know, if 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 something comes up and you think, hey, this would be a great opportunity to talk about the mitigation planning process, uh, let Keith know or let me know, and and, uh, and we'll see what we can do about getting you some information. Hey, Kyle, Matt, Nevada here. Yeah. Um, we have like a monthly newsletter that goes out in the water bills. I mean, is that something that you'd want us to put in there? I mean, I'm more than gladly we could put some kind of information in that as we, you know, as we move forward. Yeah, that would be great. Um, uh, just talking a little bit about the hazard mitigation process and giving them the link to that survey. I mean, that's going to hit everybody. Okay. Kyle? And, and Yes, sir. Uh, I'll use this. I was going to wait to the end, but I'll jump in right now uh, within the county what our intention is is to point citizens back to your city clerks or to your school districts so that you can have them participate with you to get to view what those are and to see if they're if they're reasonable for your community so for instance I have been on KHOI I men mentioned that this plan was coming up and during that time on the radio I said Get with your local, uh, your local uh, city administration or your school district. Work through them because, as you've mentioned, the things that are out there are unique to your communities. And I think you, as city administration and school districts, want to hear those things, be able to collate them. And as you are developing and analyzing the risk in your communities, and as you're developing those strategies, I, I think that more one-on-one -on -one conversation will be essential for you to develop what you want uh, for your for your community. So everything we put together, uh, we will be putting out press releases. We'll put it on the web page here at Story County. We'll put it out via Facebook. Everything's going to point them on back to the local officials uh, to discuss these items. That's all I got, Kyle. Cool, thank you. Uh, and then just to follow up, uh, uh, Matt, uh, We'll get together separately and try to figure out, you and I and Keith, and try to figure out how to word what we want to put into that newsletter. That's a, that's a, that's a pretty good idea. Yes, that would be great. Uh, the next slide, so the next thing that we do is review community capabilities. Uh, we conduct an inventory of communities existing and proposed policies, programs, and ordinances that may affect vulnerability to hazards. This is where we rely on, on each community a lot to let us know what these things are. Uh, we'll try to determine communities' technical and fiscal ability to implement mitigation in initiatives uh, and, your, and uh, make sure that we include the ability to attract and leverage funding. 
uh, we'll consider we'll consider special opportunities to enhance or supplement these capabilities, and we do that through the data collection guide. And and, and uh, the data collection guide is one of the things that I sent out before the meeting, and you'll get it again when I send out the uh, uh, the uh, meeting summary next week. Uh, basically, what we're asking for is each community to do one data collection guide and just answer as many of those questions as, as you can. Uh, I'll fall back on the data collection guide, much like the mitigation plan is not a test. Uh, you don't pass or fail anything, it's just what do you have and what don't you. Uh, so we try to get as much information as we can get. Uh, the more information that we get, the better information we can feed into the plan and, and, and work it through the process. Next slide, uh, we'll conduct a risk assessment and, and, and we're just getting started with this right now, but during the risk assessment, uh, basically when you look at a risk assessment, you identify hazards, so what can happen here? Uh, you identify community capabilities, what are our existing capabilities to reduce risk and we look at vulnerability, what will be affected? Uh, we identify and describe hazards, we identify assets, we assess risk and we summarize vulnerability. And we do this uh, on the next slide, so this is the whole slide on, on the data collection guides. Uh, skip ahead a little bit. Uh, so one of the things that we do with the data collection guides is they have whole sections on there about different hazards that you've, that you've experienced, uh, what your hazard history is. So we'll ask you to go in and we'll ask you to highlight those hazards, tell us how they impacted you, uh, and uh, give us that information on that data collection guide. Uh, just a little bit more on that data collection guide, there are separate forms for local governments and schools, so uh, when you fill out uh, the form, uh, make sure that you're filling out the right one. Uh, it should say right on the top which one it is. Uh, we're gonna ask for those to be due back by March 14th, so I'm giving you a little bit of extra time there. Uh, it gives me a little bit of a buffer to get the, uh, the summary out and then send you another copy of it, but your community should have a copy of it now. Everybody that's involved in this meeting, uh, that should have been sent to you as a handout. So we'll be looking for those to be returned by March 14th. Uh, if you have any questions on those, please give me a call, give Keith a call. Uh, usually it makes the process go, smooth, go smoother if we can address questions as soon as they come up. Like I talked about, there's a capability ass assessment section, uh, additional questions, and historic hazard events. Uh, the next slide, so I think that slide was out of order, but uh, the next slide, the hazard identification and risk assessment. So when we look at each one of these hazards, and, and you open it up, this probably doesn't look very different than the one that we wrote you five years ago, but for each hazard, there will be a hazard description that includes warning time and duration. Uh, we'll talk about geographic location where we can. So a, a good example is something like flood. I talked about, you know, we can identify where floodplains are. We probably got a pretty good idea of where where 100 year, 500 year floodplains are. When we talk about flash flooding, your communities probably have a pretty good idea. You know, if I get a heavy amount of rain, uh, we're going to have water back up here, 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 here. The water's going to go up. The water's going to go down. We do that for for uh, for hazards that. Uh, are, I don't know, localized is the right word, but hazards that kind of stay where, where they're, they're supposed to uh, occur, uh, you know, where, where they're corralled into a certain area like a floodplain. For, ge for geographic location, we can't do that for uh, all hazards. A good example is hail. Uh, you know, there's no hail plain. Uh, in the county where it's, this is the part of the county where hail occurs and this is the part of the county where it doesn't. Same for tornadoes, same for lightning, stuff like that. So we try to give as much of a good, as much of a geographic location as we possibly can. Some of times it's just the entire county. Uh, we look at previous occurrences. Uh, so we try to figure out uh, how the different hazards have hit you in the past. We have a variety of databases and, and resources that we go to to get this information initially. One of the things that we're going to do at the next meeting, actually the bulk of the next meeting, is we're going to do the preliminary analysis, the preliminary, preliminary hazard identification and risk assessment. And then we're going to walk through those hazards. And, and previous occurrences is one of those areas that I really like to walk through the hazards because uh, it can be the greatest database or it can be the greatest federal resource ever, but it's, in my experience, it's still not as good as the people that actually live in the community and have lived the hazards. 
So uh, uh, we'll talk about previous occurrences. From previous occurrences, we'll try to extra extrapolate the probability of future occurrence. Uh, let's say hypothetically that you, you uh, Story County experienced a tornado every three years. We would say in the past, we would take that and we would extrapolate and say, well, you probably got a 33% chance in the future uh, X number of years that in any given year, you're gonna experience a tornado. Uh, we do a vulnerability overview where we look at magnitude and severity and we talk about different impacts to people, mm -hmm. property, the environment. Uh, we talk about potential losses to existing development and we try to map those where applicable. Uh, we have a variety of different analytical tools that we can do to see what kind of, what kind of damages that we're probably talking about. And then we look at future development. So not only are we looking at where the county is right now, but we try to look, you know, where's the county going to be five years from now? Where's the county going to be 10 years from now? And is any of that development going to intersect with any uh, areas that make it more vulnerable to hazards? Uh, the next slide, so there are 20 hazards for consideration. We have animal plant crop disease, dam levee failure, drought, earthquake, expansive soils, extreme heat, flash flood, grass wildland fire, hazardous materials incident, human disease, uh, infrastructure failure, landslide, radiological incident, river flooding, severe winter storms, sinkholes, terrorism, thunderstorm lightning and hail, tornado windstorm, and then transportation incident. Uh, I guess that my question would be, you, you covered most, if not all of these hazards at, during your last planning process. My question would, and, and this is the this is the list that comes out of the state hazard mitigation plan. So the state of Iowa has its own hazard mitigation plan that that covers the state and state assets. Uh, I guess that as I looked at this list, the one that jumped out at me was radiological incident. I have a map uh, that shows uh, the nuclear power plants in Iowa and where their their emergency planning zones are. And Story County isn't really near any of those emergency planning zones. Uh, you guys don't have a nuclear reactor in your in your county. Uh, my only recommendation would be uh, that we don't do a full assessment of radiological because I'm not sure that we're going to see any risk. But I'm going to take that back to you because it's you guys' plan. Do any of these hazards, I mean, as you read through the list, do any of these look like hazards that the county just doesn't have a lot of experience with? Land slides. Okay. So if we were going to do a, if we were going to look at the rest of these hazards and, and, and we won't lose sight of landslide and radiological, what we'll do is in the front, we'll say, you know, we did a preliminary discussion on landslide and radiological, but the HMPC just identified that they didn't really have any history with it. We didn't do a full assessment. Uh, are you good with the other hazards? I think most of the other hazards is stuff you guys experience in one area or another. Or have the potential, yes. Okay. All right, so that's what we'll do. We'll, uh, we'll not conduct full assessments on radiological or landslide. Uh, just a little bit about the hazard ranking method. So we use what the state of Iowa uses. Uh, it's the calculated priority risk index. So we try to rank hazards based on probability, magnitude and severity, warning time, duration, uh, we'll present you these preliminary results uh, at meeting two, uh, and you can beat them up to your heart's content. Uh, maybe we, we put up a hazard too high, maybe we put up a hazard too low. That's where the, the, the community element comes in to tell us where we're right or where we're wrong based on the research that we've done. Uh, the other thing to take away from this slide is that these things are weighted. So probability has a higher rate, uh, a higher weight than magnitude, which has a higher weight than warning time, which has a, a, a higher weight than duration. On the next slide, uh, we'll do some analysis of critical facilities. So uh, the impacts of some hazards will be considered for critical facilities. For examples, for river flood, uh, we'll look at critical facilities in the floodplain. 
For levy failure, we'll look at community critical facilities and levy protected areas. And then hazardous materials incidents, we try to take a look at critical facilities in a half mile uh, isolation zone of tier two facilities and try to map that where possible. Uh, the critical facility inventory in GIS format is currently being compiled. We pull data from the Iowa DNR GIS laboratory li library. We pull it from the HAZIS database and then uh, your, your GIS person has been really good about working with our GIS person to get all the layers that we're asking for. So we'll try to pull as much local data when possible. Again, in my experience, local data is always better and we try to use it whenever possible. The next slide, uh, just a little discussion on critical facilities. So when we talk about critical facilities, we identify it as any facility essential in providing utility or correction either during the response to an emergency or during the recovery operation. We talk about essential facilities, facilities that damage would have uh, devastating impacts uh, on disaster response and or recovery, high potential loss, if it was damaged, it would have a high loss or impact on the community, and then transportation or lifeline, those assets that are critical for transportation and provision of necessary utilities. The next slide, just some examples. So examples of essential facilities, hospitals, and other medical facilities, first responders, emergency operations centers, those high potential loss facilities, power plants, dams and levees, hazardous materials sites, schools, transportation and lifeline, highways, roads, bridges and tunnels, uh, railroads and facilities, bus facilities, uh, you know, the, the Ames Airport. Uh, just give some examples of different critical facilities that we take a look at. Uh, on the next slide, after we go through and do that hazard identification and risk assessment, we'll develop the mitigation strategy. So once we're through the HIRA, uh, we'll have identified, you know, this is what can hit you, this is how hard it can hit you, this is how you're vulnerable. Then we go through and we talk about the mitigation strategy. And we do this in a, in a two-step process. One is we look at your, your mitigation actions from five years ago and we, we validate those. And we ask you to look at them and say, uh, you know, uh, did we implement them? Again, my fallback is not a test. It's no, there's no right or wrong answer. If you didn't implement something, you didn't implement something. You probably had a good reason. Uh, but we'll take a look at the old uh, mitigation actions. We'll, we'll ask you to tell us, uh, you know, was this implemented? Was it not implemented? Uh, is it completed or does it need to be deleted? Uh, and we've got, a, we've got a pretty easy form for you to follow for doing that. Um, so, uh, that's where we'll start. And then we'll take a look at the hazard identification and risk assessment results and we'll, we'll walk through, well, is there anything new we have to add? Any new projects that have, that have, that, you know, we, that have spurred our interest since we've got this new hazard identification and risk assessment? Uh, we'll use the, for the planning goals, uh, we start with the planning goals from the old plan. Some people like to change them, some people don't. I'm usually a proponent of if they're good, let's not change them, but that's up to you guys. Uh, we'll link those with related goals from other existing plans. We we'll want to make sure that we reduce losses to existing development, future development, and, and like I said, at that third meeting, uh, that third meeting is going to be all about potential mitigation actions. So that's where we'll discuss that. I. Uh, so those are the steps that we'll go through. Uh, as far as the next steps in the planning process, uh, data collection guides, like I said, we're gonna ask for those uh, due back by March 14th of 2018, and you can just email those to me. I'll be your your, your main point of contact for Amy Foster Wheeler uh, as we go through the process. Uh, our second planning meeting has been scheduled April 25th, which I believe is a Wednesday, and I think it's a seven o'clock meeting again. Like I said, That'll be a face-to-face -face meeting. We'll talk about the risk assessment update results as we've gotten them. Uh, we'll talk about reviewing and updating your mitigation of goals, and we'll begin the process of, of updating on those previous mitigation actions. The third and final planning meeting, we've got it scheduled for June 27th. Uh, it's a status update summary of, of previous mitigation action plans, so we'll ask for all that information by that meeting. And then we'll brainstorm and discuss potential new mitigation new mitigation actions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about implementing the plan uh, and uh, plan maintenance. One of the things that we want to do in the plan is make sure that we outline, you know, this plan isn't just going to sit on a shelf. This is how, this is how we're going to review it. This is how we're going to tie it into, uh, this is how we're going to tie it into uh, other existing planning mechanisms. So just a reminder of the requirements, I always like to finish up with this for each one of the jurisdictions to be a participant. 
five. Make sure that we, we get each jurisdiction to have at least one person attend each of the three planning meetings. Make sure that we get a data collection guide back from each jurisdiction. Make sure that we get a previous mitigation actions uh, report uh, from each jurisdiction. And then any new or continuing <coughs> actions that you want to have go in the new plan, uh, we will uh, we'll ask you to provide that as well. Uh, this link is not active yet, but we use Box.com as a as a file sharing mechanism uh, to provide information. So when I when we publish the first draft of the high res, we publish draft plans. Uh, we'll put it up on that Box.com link. Uh, that's still active for us, as far as I know. If some changes, we'll, we'll move to a different system. But for right now, that's the link uh, where we'll start pushing stuff up. That's the end of my presentation. I just wanted to, to kind of give you an overview of what we're doing, uh, what it's going to take for each jurisdiction to be involved, uh, and to encourage you to be involved in the process. The more you guys are involved, the better plan that we come up with. With that, do you guys have any questions? Uh, for me, is it is it clear as mud? Got one question in the back. Go ahead. Uh, second slide from the end. Uh, requirements attend three planning meetings uh, a couple a slide or so earlier uh, you listed a second planning meeting and a third planning meeting is this the first planning meeting and if that's the case uh, if their community is not here how can they attend three planning meetings so this is the first planning meeting uh, for communities that aren't represented I uh, We'll probably do some coordination with them. Uh, the state is pretty okay with as long as we as long as we give them the basic feel of what the meeting was, uh, they're okay. And we've also recorded this one because we did have one community that just plain couldn't have somebody here uh, doing it. This is to get you guys set to know what what's expected out of you. Those other actions, those other two planning meetings they're pretty much non-negotiable and those <clears throat> actions up there will be non-negotiable on that and there's one thing that he didn't mention is again a, an official resolution to adopt the plan by your yep. city council will be the last and final uh, way of making sure that you qualify for uh, being a partner to this plan yeah thanks for thanks for bringing that up I forgot to put that on the list John. When would that resolution likely take place? Good July question. August. What we what we will do in order to extend the life of the plan? We did this last time. Hopefully, this plan will sail through FEMA and it'll plop down on our desk as approved pending adoption. We since the board of supervisors has a meeting every week, the, your your clock starts on the plan as soon as one jurisdiction approves it. So just before it goes dead we'll adopt the plan up with uh, story county board of supervisors push it out to the rest of you then you'll need to adopt it in accordance with your meeting schedule that makes it the easiest for you all but that makes sure that we get the most life out of our plan and that we we maintain that coverage as we go through that for five years then it'll be good for five years but as you can see that doesn't mean we start again in five years. It means we start again in uh, five years minus a year and a half, two years. The grant cycle is one of the reasons we're starting this a little bit earlier than what we normally would have, but managing to get this at limited cost uh, is the reason that we've kind of pushed it a little bit earlier. So when does the existing one expire? May of 2019. We'll resolution in April. Probably have the sample resolution pushed out in April, but we will again specify go ahead and let Board of Supervisors hit it the first time, and then any time after that, you'll be cleared to go ahead and uh, get the approval. So, April of 2019. 19. But we'll have, we'll have the draft done way before that. It, but one of the reasons that we do this so so early is you never, for instance, during all of the uh, hurricanes and like that, a lot of the FEMA staff was drawn down to other places, and you can't always rely 
on getting it done uh, as early as we were fortunate enough as we did last time. We always want to be ahead of the game, have it sitting there on the shelf ready to go. Hey Kyle, this is Melissa. Yeah. When will that link for the survey be live? The link for the survey is live right now. If you click on it, you can just go to it. Okay. And if you can't, let me know. Because <laughs> I think it's live. Okay, we'll check it out. Other questions from folks uh, on the phone or online? Okay, I've, I've got just a few closing notes here. First off, you're not starting from scratch. The great thing is we worked with this company before. The, the strategies and like that that you have, we really encourage you to use that as a baseline uh, to look things over because we you all did a good job last time. So look at those and consider those. A key thing that we're doing here is prioritizing. That's why you go through the risk and you identify which risks are the most important. Then as you develop those strategies, the, where you want to put your time and effort should be driven towards those risks that you think are, are the highest ones that are out there. This can be just an academic situation mm -hmm. or we can really go through this. And one of the things they're going to ask you to do is what we call a stapley, where you're going to look at each one of these great ideas out there and you're going to have to look inward. Does this meet the social uh, uh, makeup of my community? Is this politically feasible? One of the big ones is always zoning. It's a great idea, but is it, is it politically acceptable to go ahead and, and restrict use on, on land in order to make it safer? These are all questions, and this is why I keep pushing it back to your community. These are decisions you, in conjunction with your communities, are going to have to make when it looks to weighing uh, cost-benefit of some of these things. Um, this is a partnership with AMIC. Uh, Kyle said, AMIC's going to do this for you, AMIC's going to do this for you. I'll correct him a little bit. AMIC's going to do this with you. They're going to do a lot of the, the paperwork and, and a lot of analysis that we don't have the skills here to do or the IT folks to do. They're going to give you that background data. You've got to grab it, you've got to look at it, and you've got to personalize it. Uh, to your community. So I keep going back to this. They'll give you a baseline. This is for your community. Don't just think about grabbing FEMA money. Think about making your what, what you're going to do, realistically do, over the next five years to make your communities safer and better. If you didn't get something done last time, maybe we didn't look at that stapley quite right when, when we were going through this. Let's really grab two to three good things that you get done are much more valuable than five things that we just keep rolling over year after year after year. So that's all I've got. We're coming up on 8 o'clock. I thought I'd uh, shut up before we run over that time. Any, anybody well, else got any other questions? If, if you guys have any other questions that you come up with, uh, ask Keith or ask me and we'll, we'll be happy to help you. Uh, with that, that's the end of my spiel. So speak now or for don't forever hold your peace but uh you'll be you'll get like i said you'll get a meeting summary from me and, and we'll get the process rolling looking forward to getting started thanks for everybody for coming yeah thank you very much